Good morning. Welcome to the celebration of the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. I have a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, welcome to Holy Cross. Welcome to all our visitors who uh, came last night or who are coming today to celebrate the alumni weekend. Uh, last night was a great time for those who missed it. We got to hear jokes from Mr. Chastain. Some were actually funny, <laughs> some. Uh, but most of all, we got to gather as the church, and we got to gather as family and friends and enjoy one another. Um, we have a reception that will immediately follow the divine service, and that will take place in the fellowship center downstairs. And we will also have tours of the school, if you are interested, uh, that will go on between, school, uh, between services. And um, we have all these beautiful stained glass windows, and we have printouts in the window seals if you are curious uh, where they came from and what's behind them, the story behind them, you can grab one of those. So with that, we will follow the service as is laid out for us in our bulletin. Let us open with our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Ghost. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Dear beloved, I have good news. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
with you. Let us pray. Let your merciful ears be attentive to the prayers of your servants. And by your word and spirit, teach us how to pray that our petitions may be pleasing before you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading for the 10th Sunday after Pentecost is from Genesis chapter 18. Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Adam stood still before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous far fare as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I, who am, I, who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy if I find 45 there. Again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, not, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way, and when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle comes to us from the letter to the Colossians, chapter 2. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit, according to human traditions, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses, and the uncircumcised of your flesh. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt, and stood against us with its legal demands. 
This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. This is the word of the Lord. Let us stand in honor of our gospel lesson. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 11th chapter. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine who has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impulsiveness, in imprudence, he will raise, rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you for coming to church this morning. Jesus told the disciples in Acts chapter 1, you will be my witnesses. And you may never have thought about this, but when you come to church, you are witnessing to me, to one another, that you take all this church stuff and Jesus seriously. Thank you. And thanks also to the committee that put on that wild thing last night. That was great. I love the food. The program was not too short and not too long. It was just right. And speaking of just right, I am inspired now to get out my accordion and get the dust off of it. No, that was really good last night. So thanks to all who especially not only attended, but really put in time to make it a wonderful evening. My text for this sermon is from 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at the 17th verse. And since you call Father, the one who judges each one's work with impartiality, conduct the time of your sojourn in fear, knowing that you were redeemed from the vain ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things, silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. I was asked a few weeks ago, what one thing have you learned in your years of ministry? I graduated from the seminary 43 years ago, and the question put to me was, what one thing have you learned in all those years? And I thought that's a pretty appropriate question for an alumni weekend, an alumni sermon. What thing, especially what spiritual religious thing, have you learned over your years? You have to answer for yourself. I can only tell you what the answer is for me. I, in some things, I'm a driven person. A lot of things don't make me any mind, but in some things, I am a driven person. And one of the things that's been driving me for some time is how do I talk to Jesus? The Old Testament lesson and the Gospel lesson talked about prayer. And I don't mean simply prayer, which is obviously talking to Jesus. What I mean is what, what approach, what mindset, what attitude do I have when I go to Jesus? Most of my life is over, unless I live to be 139, which might be cool, I don't know. But you know, probably most of my life will be over. I was told that my insurance, it, it vanishes at age 100. It'll be gone. All that money I put in, it'll be gone. So at this stage of my life, how do I approach Jesus? What's my mind toward him? How do I talk to him is really becoming important because it's not going to be too terribly long before I see him face to face and I see him in judgment. He comes back to judge the world. What's that going to be like? Oh, Dale, glad to see you, man. You did so many good things. Things Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Or, what's your name? <laughs> and you want, uh-uh. <laughs> I got a computer printout on you. Many say to me, Lord, Lord, and I will say to them, depart from me, I don't know you. Hey, who's to say? 
So this idea of, of how I approach Jesus, how I think about Jesus, how I talk to Jesus, whoa, that's pretty important. And I hope you understand it is for you too. Because each of us dies alone. Now I was raised in a church very much like Holy Cross. Diane and I moved to Collinsville and joined Holy Cross in 1981. But I was raised and grew up at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Chicago Heights. That's about 211th Street South, south side, south suburbs of Chicago. And I mean, it was, it was a lot like it. Church families go to church every Sunday. A healthy congregation that was growing. Lutheran school. Wow. Sunday school. You know, that's how it was. And I'll tell you about growing up that way. I learned a lot of stuff about Jesus. And then after public high school, I went to Concordia College and Concordia Seminary. And man, I really, I don't mean big-headed, be big-headed now, but I know a lot of stuff about Jesus. And you do too. And the fact that you and I have this history, most of us with the church and organized religion, means that we are tempted to think, yeah, yeah, I understand Jesus. I got Jesus. And the more and more I think about it, that, that is dangerous. That is eternally dangerous dangerous. You know the New Testament somewhat well. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus pronounced seven woes upon the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a religious group. I mean, they were strict in their religious observance. And in Matthew 23, he pronounced woes seven times upon them. Woe to you Pharisees, he says, you have a mission and evangelism program, but woe to you. Woe to you, Pharisees. You have a stewardship program. Woe to you, Pharisees. You are theologians and Bible students. Woe to you, Pharisees. You know your bylaws and synodical and church history and constitution. Woe to you, Pharisees. You like to be honored. You knew that your liturgy and stuff Woe to you, because you're like, you're like a whitened sepulcher, and inside you're full of dead bones and rotting stuff. Now, Jesus knew that because he's got x-ray vision. I don't, you don't. And I'm totally convinced that had I lived in the first century A.D., I would have been a Pharisee. Because that outward religious conduct impressed me. I think he'd been a Pharisee, too. <laughs> and looking at you all here in your Sunday clothes, sitting in pews, doing the right religious thing, I think most of you would have been taken in by the Pharisees. But Jesus pronounced woe on the Pharisees. In Mark chapter 12, he says that you know neither the scriptures or the power of God. And I'm really fearful that at that great day when I come before him, he might pronounce woe upon me. Woe upon you. I uh, may be unsettling you a little bit in your pews. I certainly hope I am. So under, underneath my obsession about how do I approach, how do I 
talk to Jesus is one fundamental thing. And this one fundamental thing is something that I have learned in my years of ministry. I am still learning it now, and I won't have it down the way I should until I see him. So that person asked, what's the one thing that you've learned? Well, the one thing I've learned and I'm still learning is to fear God. To fear God. I've been traveling from church to church most Sundays for almost 30 years. Next Sunday, I'll be down in your home state. I'll be right outside of Houston, Texas. Oh, boy, the humidity there ought to be a doozy. And then I'll bring more hot air to it. But I don't hear much in the church anymore about the fear of God. You know, those of you who went to school back at Holy Cross or I went to St. Paul's Lutheran School, one of the things we had to memorize was we should fear and love God. That's certainly not heard in our society at all. And as I say, when I travel around, I don't hear much talk about the fear of God either in the church in this day and age. And I rather suspect that that's one of the reasons why a lot of churches are floundering. Let me put my professor cap on and talk about the fear of God. The word fear comes up buku times in the Bible. And it's used in a variety of ways. One of the ways... One of the extremes by which the word fear is used is when you're in a position that something is coming at you that is bigger than you are, more powerful than you are. You cannot contend with it, and it's coming to get you. A heart attack, a diagnosis of cancer, your spouse saying, I'm out of here. You find out that the kids are doing drugs. Your financial house of cards is collapsing. It's coming at you. It's bigger than you are, and you can't deal with it, and it's going to get you. In the Bible, there's another use of fear. And the feeling is very similar. Something comes at you that is bigger than you are, more powerful than you are. You can't begin to contend with this big thing that's coming at you, but this is coming at you to help you. Not to hurt you, to save you, not to condemn you, to be for you, not against you, to be your friend and not your impersonal enemy. And the feeling that you have when you understand that that is God coming into your life, my little life, That is what the Bible calls the fear of God. Psalm 34, 11, come my children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So I say the one thing I think that I need to learn more and more, and I think the church does, is to fear God. It doesn't mean that we're scared to death that he's going to punish us for our sins. He could, and that would be on this side, you know. But the fear of God is an awe, a reverence, a wonder. It's a, it's, the fear of God is shut up, Dale. He loves you. Shut up, put your name in. He loves you. He comes to help you and save you. And one day he's going to take you through the valley and you are going to hear, Come, ye blessed of my Father. I mean, if we don't fear God, why would we love Jesus? If we don't dread the punishment for our sins, 
then why would we be motivated to yearn for a Savior? If we don't have this feeling of, of desperation, I need help and I can't contend with everything that's coming at me. If we don't have that feeling of desperation, well then yeah, sure, we'll be blasé about the church, blasé about the Bible, baptism, communion, blasé about the fellowship of the saints. Yeah. We should fear and love God. And that's what's behind St. Peter in this passage. I read it again. Since you call him Father, who judges each one's work without partiality, conduct the time of your sojourn with fear. Again. The fear is, wow, what a friend I have in Jesus. Knowing that you were redeemed from the vain ways handed down to you, not with corruptible things, silver and gold, your uh, financial portfolio, your retirement plan, your family, and those things, they're not to be despised, but you were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. So to wrap, wrap this up, I'm probably going longer than the program did last night. Um, without a musical interlude, the good news is that there's help for Pharisees. There's hope for Pharisees. You remember Nicodemus, the guy that went to Jesus in the middle of the night? He was a Pharisee. And Jesus finally says, he says, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't get this stuff? By the end of the Gospel of John, Nicodemus no longer appears in the dark night, but he is in the light of day which the Gospel writer John uses to tell us Nicodemus came into the light of Christ. And Paul, he was a Pharisee too. And what, what a model he is for us Pharisees. In Philippians chapter 3, he says, if anyone is persuaded that he is something in the flesh in this world, I more. Circumcised on the eighth day from the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, according to the standard of the law of Pharisee, the law in the Bible refers to the Old Testament, the commandments, and for the Pharisees, it meant all the traditions that they had piled on top of the commandments to obscure them. Paul says, according to the law of Pharisee and according to the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. He says, I did the right religious stuff. I did what they taught me. I took it seriously. I excelled. I was blameless. I, 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 I. But then this Pharisee says, but whatever was gained for me, I now count all this as lost because of Christ. But even more than that, I consider all things to be lost because of the surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, through whom I do count everything as lost, I consider it garbage so that I might gain Christ and be found in him, be found in him. I need to be more intimate with Jesus. I suspect you do too, that I might be found in him, not having my own righteousness which comes from the law, 
but the righteousness that is because of through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is based upon faith, God's righteousness. And then here it comes, because I'm not going to live to be 139 and neither are you. So that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And that I may share in his sufferings, being conformed to his death. If that I might attain unto the resurrection from the dead. That's the one thing that I am learning still today. Paul says in Galatians, it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I, you can say it, the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That, friends, is the fear and love of God. It is a great time to be the church. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Let us stand as we continue with the Apostles' Creed on page 7 in our bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He ascended to heaven. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit that we may not doubt but boldly believe that because have mercy. We pray for the interceding heart of Christ to be formed in us, that we might join in his supplications for the world, asking God saved. Lord, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the growing understanding of our baptism that we may know it is as, as the foundation of our life as children of God's family, and by the Spirit's grace be gifted with Lord, have mercy. For our, and for the, that we may not be taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition and the elemental spirits of the world, but be guarded from all error in Christ's word and kept faithful in the way of his true bride, the holy Christian church. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Barack, our president, for all who make and administer our laws and preside over the courts, that they may receive wisdom and govern us with justice, that the poor may not be oppressed and the vulnerable not be left undefended. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who suffer, those who hurt, those who are in need, those with illnesses of body and mind, we pray especially this day for Doris, Elaine, Diana, 
Faye, Karen, Joe, Kathy, Ron, Linda, Noah, Roger, Bill, Pat, Jim, Blake, Marie, Marianne, Ruth, Elaine, Chrissy, Wayne, Craig, Diana, Dakota, Tom, Jim, Mary Lou, Nancy, Chris, Harper, Norma, Charlene, Ken, Virginia, Norma, Garrett, Gary, Elaine, Kelly, Tom, Melba, Eloise, Dennis, Elfrida, Loina, Lorena, Peggy, Alicia, Margaret, Amy, and those who we name in our hearts. Send forth your mercy and your comfort, that they might be sustained in faith in their hour of trial, and grant help and healing through the doctors and medical staffs that God has provided for their care and their comfort. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who, for all those who know the fullness of our Father's goodness in his heavenly court, let us give thanks to God, asking that we too may one day join them in beholding him face to face. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, bless us and keep us in safety. Strengthen us that even though violence is near, we may be kept safe according to your peace and your mercy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Your hands, dear Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with the gathering of the offering.
let it stand. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Mm -hmm.